cover the north region. Um, so I, I look at Argyll and Buttes, look at the Highlands, Western Isles, and Orkney. And really delighted to be joined by our colleague today, Mary Thompson, as well, who's another STEM education officer um, who works in Forth Valley. Um, we are also both working at the moment on COP26 and learning for sustainability a couple of days a week. So this, although this doesn't actually necessarily associate with this, this is the most recent of what I think has been a really successful program of outdoor learning webinars. So really pleased about today it's, um, and who we're going to hear from today. So what we're going to be talking about is what can we learn from outdoor learning research? And obviously, we've got quite a mixed group of people here. So we've got some people from early years, some people from secondary, maybe some people from CLD as well as primary. So again, we will try and cover as much as we can. But there will be probably areas that perhaps you would like to investigate further. Again, put them in the chat, any questions, anything like that, and we'll see if we can answer them. If we can't answer them, we will get back to you with as good an answer as we can once we find out. So today you're going to hear from Professor Pete Higgins, who's the Chair in Outdoor Environmental and Sustainability Education at the Murray House um, School of Education and University of Edinburgh. Uh, we'll also hear from Dr. Beth Christie, who's the Senior Lecturer, Programme Director for the Learning for Sustainability Programme. Um, Dr. Roger Scruton, who's Honorary Research Fellow in Outdoor Education. We'll also hear from Neil Smith, um, from Dolphin House in South Ayrshire, and David McKillop, who's an outdoor education instructor, researcher, and primary teacher. So really interesting to hear from, from all these people, their point of view about research in relation to outdoor learning. So I'm not going to say any more. Um, I have encouraged you to use the chat, and I encourage you to use it again. Um, I'll monitor that as we're going on. And finally, just keep our mics muted, our cameras off. That will help the bandwidth. And I will now pass over to Mari to control the slides and to say hello to Pete. Thanks for joining us today, Pete. Thanks, Mark. Okay, looks like we're ready to go. Thank you, Mari. Um, are you hearing me okay? Thank you. Grant. Okay, so um, my task here is really to introduce uh, this session with some discussion around the nature of outdoor learning research. Um, for context, um, Beth and Roger are my close colleagues. Um, Neil and David are graduates from our master's programs, which have been running now for about 50 years. And, and uh, I, I apologize for the Edinburgh centered uh, focus here. It's essentially because, well, we've been around for a long time, but also that uh, other colleagues from other universities in Scotland couldn't join us, notably our excellent colleague Greg Mannion from Stirling, who we've done a lot with over the years. Um, what I, I, I would just like to say at the start, really, though, is um, although we've been here for a long time, 50 years, that we, we've really only recently started to get interested in research as such. And uh, what I'm really keen that you appreciate is that this is not a how to do outdoor learning. Um, you'll pick up some things from us, but it's about researchers and about evaluation. So I hope you see the, the, the difference between those. And we'll come to more practical aspects towards the end, including a free book that I've passed on to Mary that you can all access. Okay, so the what, the why, and the how of outdoor learning research. Next, please, Mary. So uh, Neil and David would know fine that I'm, I just normally would be on my way back from the Isle of Rum very recently, having been there with students like they were themselves. And I'd have been looking out for white-tailed sea eagles. Now this species has been extinct for about 100 years, um, but it's now been successfully reintroduced. So what does a successful reintroduction look like? You're probably wondering why I'm talking about sea eagles. Well, that will be revealed. Um, how is it relevant to outdoor learning research? That will be revealed too. Next, please, Mary. Um, before I get to the sea eagle bit, um, I, I'd, I'd like to just uh, start with this. Um, uh, we may, in terms of thinking about outdoor learning research, want answers, all right? We want answers because we want to do things that we know work. Um, this statement here, why bother when we know it works, could actually have been me. 30, 40 years ago when I started in, in my field. Well, 30 odd, yeah. Um, we know it works, but actually, is that good enough? 
uh, we can't communicate that to anyone. If we are asked by our managers, why do you want to take the kids out? Uh, we tend to be quite defensive uh, and we're, we're trying to find a rationale for why we take kids out. But actually, that, that is not a, a reasonable question to, to ask in the first place. What we should be saying to our managers is, you tell me why you want to have these kids in a classroom and I'll tell you why I want to take them out. But that's not helpful either. What is most helpful is to think about this. How can we understand and improve our practice? Because we're going to take them out anyway. Next, please, Marin. So um, outdoor learning research and learning for sustainability research is really an infant. Um, it's only really emerged in the last 50 or 60 years and probably more recently in the last 20. Um, the first doctoral graduate is our wonderful colleague, Robbie Nicholl, now Professor Robbie Nicholl, 2001, and Beth, 2004. Now, I was their supervisor and I'm a fish biologist who happens to like kayaking and other outdoor activities. So it just goes to show how limited our understanding would be that somebody like me would have been supervising these people. Next, please, Mary. But they too have now supervised a bunch of PhD students very, very successfully. So they are, like the sea eagle, uh, the next generation. They have, they, they've essentially made the transition to being people who can supervise doctoral research. Um, and so the graduates that we have supervised, that doctoral and others, are now working independently. And indeed, Neil and David are two examples of that from our master's programme. Now about 40 PhD graduates have come through our programmes and about 10 or 20 from other universities in Scotland. And probably an equivalent number nationally, probably about 50 or 60 across the whole of the UK. So the first publications were really in our field in the, in the early 1990s, and now there are hundreds. Um, but I have to say that a lot of these are not empirical, and I'll come to what that means in a moment. They're often philosophical and thought pieces because it's difficult to do research in our field. Um, we are very fortunate. We've got five full-time staff and others with a strong interest, and, and the two research fellows, Roger being one of them. So are we flying? Well, we've made progress. Now, this, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what researchers try to do. So if you, you can imagine a wall like this. Now, if you are, are really ambitious, you try to build a new wall. We are building a wall that is, uh, is going to look like outdoor learning once it's constructed. Now, the wall is partly made, but it's pretty rough and ready. And so what we're trying to do, what Beth, Roger, Neil and David and others are trying to do is put little stones in that wall to make the structure. Now, research is really about the story of the, the what, the why and the how. So what is happening in the first place? And then why is what happening is the next thing we want to know. And then perhaps how is this happening? And then sometimes, particularly because we're interested in education, is there a change through what is happening? And um, does where make a difference? Does place make a difference? And what do we think or feel about that? What do the students we work with think or feel in this process? And what changes should we make to what? So there's a whole range of questions that cascade from this notion of what. Next, please, Mary. So it can be a whole range of things, as I say, they can be quite specific. It could be, you know, do my students learn better when I take them to a stream and, and, uh, and, and they get to play about in the water uh, or alongside the stream without supervision, or if I direct them through a particular task. That could be a something specific, or it could be much more general about um, do a range of outdoor activities with my students, help them to sleep better at night, particularly for children with additional support needs. So we have two main ways of progressing. And in the natural sciences, you're very familiar with this, particularly through the COVID times, that there are empirical, often experimental approaches necessary. And that, that it relies on the idea that there are facts to be known. In the social sciences, life isn't quite so straightforward. We're often exploring issues. Next, please, Mary. So in the social sciences, the, the, the methodology has to be appropriate to that looser, more, more uh, uh, unspecific nature of what we're trying to uh, understand. It is often qualitative, um, uh, which has many different forms of inquiry, and I won't get into that today. Um, and it's, it's hard to define because it has um, a range of methodological approaches. And researchers often use mixed methods, which you'll hear about from some of the others. 
Next, please. So if you just look at these two as a, as a comparison, you know, the, in the natural sciences, which I used to be and Roger used to be in, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you think of a study, decide a hypothesis and away you go. In the social sciences, you're not even sure whether you've got a proper hypothesis in the first place. Can you control variables? Often not. Can you set up a control study? Often not. So you're wrestling with much more uncertainty. And it, in, in that sense, that's one of the reasons why it's difficult to do uh, outdoor learning research. Next, please. So what is the basis of successful research in outdoor learning? And I'm mentioning learning for sustainability as well. Beth will come on to that in a moment, because as I'm sure most of you know, outdoor learning is through a lot of work um, now part of, of uh, learning for sustainability too. So we need to understand what we're trying to achieve in the first place. We need to be quite clear about that. And then we need to try to understand the practices that are involved educationally. Remember, of course, that sociologists are interested in these areas and psychologists are as well. So we're starting to build a, a, a range of different studies around a, a range of different disciplines. Um, we can approach studies in a similar way to the natural sciences where you've got questionnaires and tests, etc. But we need to be quite careful because I gave up being a fish biologist because fish were pretty straightforward. People are much more interesting because they're tricky. And so we need to be, bear that in mind. And then, of course, if you think about what educational researchers do in the classroom, that's really easy compared to what you do in the outdoors. They don't have the variables of all the weather chat that I was listening to uh, when people were joining. They don't have the complexities of students wandering off, etc. There's heaps of different variables. And so it adds dimensions to this. And in addition to this, of course, it's very poorly funded. It's very difficult to get funding for outdoor learning research. Next, please, Mary. Um, so what's the difference between research and evaluation? I'm coming to the end of my bit now. And, um, and essentially, research is this focused, intentionally designed study uh, that we're trying to build theory around quite often. Evaluation is rather different in that it, um, it's much more about your daily practices. It's the things that you can do yourself um, within the, the sessions or the classes that you're working with. Um, and gathering information through evaluate, evaluation can be very helpful in our own work. And, and I would encourage you to do this, and I'll come to that in just a moment. Um, you might want to get a bit of help from uh, someone who's a research specialist, and it can well be someone who happens to have done a master's degree of any sort who you happen to work with, who's used to uh, doing research. And it may be that you have that background yourself, so that can add weight to your findings. But crucially, we should be very, very careful to not make claims without the support of some form of evaluation. Next, please, Mary. Now, it was this idea that people made claims without actually going through an evaluative process that led Robbie Nicholl in his PhD to come up with this framework. And I'll pass more information on to Mary. She can send on to you later um, about this if you're interested. So people would often make a claim about what they do which was really an aim because they had no evidence that they could make that claim. So what we need to think about is what aim are we trying to achieve with our students? How can we make that, that claim researchable? Well, we need to identify the assumptions first. Then we need to say what we're going to do with those students. Then we need to work out what methods we're going to use in order to evaluate whether or not we can make those claims. Um, and, and of course, then there's the evaluative process. Then you can make your claims. So in this little framework here, you could put in for a desired learning outcome anything you like. Um, it could be, is somebody good at, knit, I don't know, knitting or something. Uh, but you could do that research on knitting. But actually, for us, we're interested generally in environmental learning, personal and social learning, and of course, physical activity and skill development, and in, indeed, health and well-being. Next, please, Mary. So I've just picked um, an env environmental one here, but here's some, an example where you might, in your own work, um, think about, well, I'm, I need to teach the water cycle. Well, here's a range of things that I can do. I need to work at what my aims are, my assumptions, content, etc., and then I can work at what my claims are. Next, please, Mary. This is where I hand over to my wonderful colleague, Beth Christie, who uh, will talk to you about this review that we did uh, in 2000 for the Scottish Government. Over to you, Beth. 
Thanks, Pete. Um, okay, so just to follow on from what Pete said there, yeah, I want to start to, to drill down a little bit into a particular piece of research that Pete and I were involved in. So it was something that we were involved in 2019, we were starting to work on this, um, and it came out at the start of 2020, that wonderful year. Um, and it was a piece of work that was commissioned by Scottish Government. It's, uh, if you just go back one slide for just now, if that's okay, thank you. Um, it's a piece of work that was commissioned by the Scottish Government. It's, um, it was really, as Pete said, it's focusing on learning for sustainability, but as, as Pete also said, outdoor learning is part of that. And what I want to focus on just in this next short while is, is that kind of headline of outdoor learning that goes through this. And before I get into it, I want to just uh, pick up on a couple of things that kind of build, well, hopefully build on what Pete's just said about um, outdoor learning research in general. And the first thing I think that's important is to, and I'm kind of thinking here of that, that wall diagram that he had, or, or the photograph that he had, that this, uh, the fact that Scottish Government commissioned a piece of work that was looking at learning for sustainability and outdoor learning is in itself, I think, is significant because you could be asking yourself a question, well, you know, why is the Scottish Government paying attention to this? Why are they commissioning research in this field? And for me, and I would say for Pete as well, for us when we saw this come along was that this was really a reflection, a recognition of the value of outdoor learning a recognition that research has a role to play here in terms of continually examining and considering, reflecting, looking at the value um, and the impact, and that can be positive and negative, you know, and, and the value and the impact in the round of these kind of educational approaches. The second thing to highlight here that I think is important is the process of the, the commission process that we were going through, the way in which the study developed. Because to me, this was starting to highlight that research, practice, and policy really come together. The interface, they are, you know, they should be working together in some kind of respectful relationship. They should be informing one another. That's, you know, how this process should be. We shouldn't be having research happening in isolation. I know that it can, but my view is that we should, it shouldn't be happening. We shouldn't have policies sort of being formed in isolation. It can, but my view is that actually these things should be happening together. And they should always be, as much as they can be, rooted in practice as well. So I think these are just significant things to, to kind of acknowledge here. Um, next slide, please, Mary. Okay, so I want to just uh, dip into this um, quickly. I don't want to get too caught in the, the mechanics of, of the literature review and what it is, because really what this was, was if you think of it as it was a point in time where we were kind of drawing a line in the sand and taking a stock take of, of where we were and, and what we knew as well. And so we were trying to um, look at national and international literature. We were looking across the, 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 the whole broad spectrum of, of, of literature. We were looking in journal articles, books, theses, dissertations, so student work, just as Pete mentioned, that there's a range of student work that holds so much fantastic um, rich and contemporary information. So we were looking across all of this. We were looking into university, uh, library, databases and, and records. And this wasn't just within educational research either. This was across the whole of the databases held within our, our libraries. So it was quite a bit. It was a substantial amount of, of literature we were trying to get to. So this is where these boxes come in. You can see the green boxes and the, and the orange ones. The green boxes here were the terms that we were using as core terms. So if you imagine it a bit like a Google search, we made sure that these were always in so educational outcomes, sustainability in school. And then these other terms, attainment, outdoor learning, education, and there were others, they're just there for examples. We added them in as extras just to, to see what they brought back to. Um, and if you want to know more about the methodology and that's your thing, then please do have a look at those reports because I'll, I'll send you the links in the chat box at the end, but they're on the Scottish Government website as well because there's a lot of detail as to how this was, was, was happening. But basically what we were trying to do was manage that volume of, of literature. So we were casting a net out there, but we didn't want everything to come back at once. But actually, yeah, heck of a lot of stuff did come back. So I want to say a little bit about the volume of research that came in. So if we just go to the next slide. Okay, so this is just a, a graph to try and to, just to demonstrate the volume. Pete kind of talked about it specific to outdoor learning research, that there's been an increase from about, uh, or it start, really started to take off in the 1990s. But here um, from this graph, just so I can explain a little bit about what we can see there along the, 
x-axis along the bottom, the year range, this was just the range that we set our search terms within. So from 1900s up to 2018, because we were uh, doing this work in 2019. And then going up the, the side on the y-axis, this was about the number of records. So if you think of it in terms of, say, a Google search, it would be the records, the numbers that were returned, the hits returned as well. So if we just click to the next, yeah, Fantastic. So on that first section of this graph, what you can see between 1900 and 2000, over those years, we only had about 10,000 records returned. If we flip to the, the next, yeah, so on the next section from 2000 up to 2018, that span of 18 years, we were up to 50,000 were coming back in. And if we just put the last uh, piece on, yeah, so if we focus narrow down just in those three years, 2015 to 2018, there was 20,000 coming back. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the amount of research that has been happening around outdoor learning, sustainability work um, over the past uh, number of years. It's really become uh, taken off within the past three years. And I would predict if we look at what's happening recently with COVID and the um, emphasis on the outdoors and health wellbeing, I would say if we did that now, we would probably have an even higher figure coming in there. So what did this mean? What was interesting was that that volume is not just about um, the amount of research that was being done, it was the disciplines in which this research has been conducted as well. So we were seeing it across architecture, health, design, psychology. So that's fantastic because what that does is it builds up a bigger picture. It's not just the same people saying the same things necessarily, it's coming from different fields too. Okay, so returning to the, the research then, so we had all of this volume and then our job, you know, is to try and think, okay, well, how do we drill into this? How do we surface something from this? So these are, this is just to show you the themes that we then applied to that literature. So if we start from the top, just going around, um, as in you know, clockwise, we were looking at personal development, we were looking at understandings of citizenship, we were looking at attainment, skills for life, uh, poverty related attainment gap, school improvement. And these were terms that were set between Scottish government and, uh, and ourselves. But if we just click to the next as well, these weren't the only things that come up. So you might go in to look for something, but actually we have to pay attention to what comes out from the research too. So what does it tell us? So there was a whole number of other things that kind of bubbled up, which, was, which were around outdoor learning, about appropriate pedagogy, um, about contextual differences, about age difference as well. And that might be important, just thinking of the audience here tonight, perhaps, that if you're working across different age groups, different stages within education, that this, uh, that particular topic might be of interest. There was also a note here on negative findings, and that's just to point out that research doesn't always look for where things are, uh, or we shouldn't always be looking for where things are just positive. This is not about causing harm, but it's just about paying attention to, to the range of findings that exist. And so what you see here then is, uh, it seems like disparate little sections, so it's lots of little bubbles in different areas. And what we were trying to do is recognise as well that actually life isn't like that. We can't just separate it into these different areas because it all starts to come together and it's a bit messier than that. So we started to overlay things like Curriculum for Excellence, which if we click to the next part. Yeah. So if we were looking at this in terms of four capacities, for example, you, what we began to see is that there was um, aspects where there was alignment across these areas too because you can't just separate them out it becomes a bit more um, messy and, and overlapping so it's just to keep that in mind too that this is perhaps just for presentation and for structure but actually when we come to think of this we shouldn't see them as separate areas. Okay I'll just want to pick up on two short um, two small slides here that really just pick up on two of those areas and two of the areas that I think had the most to say in terms of outdoor learning as well. So the first one was on academic attainment. And generally what we were seeing here was uh, the literature was taking a holistic approach to what we would think of as attainment. So, um, so we were certainly not, when we were going into the, to look at this, we were not looking directly for links to exam results or maybe a formal kind of notion of attainment. We were looking more broadly at this. We were looking at what are the conditions that would support attainment in a more holistic way as well. And certainly that's something that came through in the literature it was quite And one of the things that was important there was that it wasn't just 
um, in the areas where you perhaps had focused a, a session, it was also in subject areas that weren't related to that outdoor context as well. So what you found was that simply being outside was actually having an effect just by going outdoors and then coming back inside. What happened inside was um, positively influenced from that outdoor experience. So it almost was like a borrowed effect that was carried through into other aspects of school life as well. The final point on there um, was studies were highlighting the benefits of time spent outdoors around areas like health, well-being, stress reduction, improved mental health and so on. All of the things that you would think, uh, which we, we know will support attainment in, in its broadest sense as well. And to me, these are things that perhaps that we've known intuitively, but what we were beginning to see was this research was... Um, was beginning to bubble through in those other fields as well. So it was coming through within psychology and, and health well-being and so on. So it was about adding a bit of collective weight was gathering here, um, which was which was interesting. And actually, again, if we think about what's happening recently with COVID, I would imagine that that area is only going to increase in terms of research that supports the value of the outdoors in a, in a broad sense too. Okay, last slide. Thank you, brilliant. So the last point to pick up on fell under the category of uh, personal development of learners. And this was really um, to do with stepping outside into the community through outdoor learning. So stepping outside and starting to engage learners in community issues. There was a lot of research that was sort of and focused on this and with the view that this was about trying to encourage learners to examine issues that exist and help them to participate in that, to help them to understand local and global perspectives, to help them to see their relationship with the wider world around them. So what came through in the research was that this was about engagement in, in real world, if we can call it kind of real world, we exist in the real world, but I, I hope you know what I mean by that, real world issues. So it was about getting involved in the messiness of that community life. So not just knowing more, but actually starting to participate as well to develop value judgments and, and critical thinking and so on, which leads into the, the next point about sites for learning. This was about trying to, coming through in the literature again, about trying to think about how you could get involved to take some action here and this wasn't necessarily about learners on their own this was around learners with, with parents or perhaps with carers with families with community groups as well um, and perhaps the clearest thing that came through in terms of the literature um, and also what one of the clearest things that stood out for me when I was looking at this was about the value of critical outdoor learning where stepping outside of the classroom and into outdoor spaces offered us an opportunity to challenge our, our thinking to our young people to challenge their thinking and, and our own as well to think about the future that we might want to think about how we might develop that relationship or our relationship with the wider world so outdoor learning here was coming through clearly as an opportunity to start to to think about how we might begin to, to move towards ways in which we can think about working towards our collective good around people and planet. So uh, uh, quite big questions and, and broad questions coming through there. And just final slide is just to come back to those two reports and, and the links to them. And I'll make sure I put them into the chat as hyperlinks. So if you're interested, you can go back and, and have a look through some of that. So thank you very much. And I'll hand on to Roger, I think is next. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay, everyone? Beth, can you? Oh, Beth's gone off. Okay, yes, yes, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I hope you can um, hear me and possibly see me. Um, yeah, we, can see and, we can hear and see you, Roger. It's all good. Good. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, as Pete said, uh, I'm a, now a research fellow in the group at Edinburgh. Um, as Pete was a fish scientist, I was a geoscientist before I came into outdoor education or as it's often called outdoor learning these days. Um, both Beth and Pete have talked a little bit about these different ways in which we can undertake outdoor learning research. I mean, what Beth's been talking about just now is really uh, a review or analysis of the published literature. Um, Pete talked a little bit about cross-sectional studies in which um, you might take a, um, a set of measurements across a group of people at any one time 
um, repeat it again at uh, later times and just uh, identify trends between demographic groups or the excellence of outdoor learning providers, for example, um, using that data. But what I'm going to talk about now is um, something that would fall under the title of experimental studies. Again, Pete mentioned this and how we have a little bit of difficulty in outdoor learning controlling our experimental studies, but basically they are forms of research that require um, an experiment that includes an intervention of some sort. And of course, in this case, we're talking about an outdoor learning intervention. And in particular, I'm going to tell you about a project that I've had a little bit to do with um, that uh, concerns the benefit and the impact of residential outdoor learning uh, among school pupils. Mary, next one, please. So this is, uh, some of you may have heard of this actually, it's the Learning Away project. Um, almost certainly the largest outdoor learning project, research project undertaken in the UK. Um, as you can see in the notes there, 6,000 pupils were you, um, involved in um, attending uh, residential outdoor learning experience. Um, 300 teachers were uh, surveyed and interviewed, 700 parents were surveyed and interview interviewed. This took place, the um, data gathering and the experimental part took place over seven years, 2008 to 2015. And right up to the present day, we've got ongoing research and that's what I've been a little bit involved in. Um, so this was to measure the impact on both primary and secondary pupils. And as it says underneath that, it was a UK wide um, project and it included one school cluster from Scotland from Calder Glen in East Kilbride. Uh, there, there's several outcomes from this project and I just want to focus on a couple of them. Uh, first of all, um, I mean, Beth talked about themes. This is a different set of themes on this occasion. These are the themes that emerged in the investigation um, where it seemed as though uh, things were happening in these areas uh, during the residential experience. Uh, just starting in that middle column, learning experience, um, they discovered that relationships between pupils and pupils and teachers and even pupils and parents were changing as a, for the better as a result. Um, there, there was concern amongst the pupils about uh, what was happening during transition from primary to secondary and uh, how the outdoor learning experience uh, impacted on their feelings around that positively. Um, uh, elements of how leadership emerged, um, how it was beneficial actually for the participants and their teachers to be involved in the design of the residentials. Um, and as Beth has mentioned several times now, what is it about outdoor learning that facilitates learning in general, because it does seem to do that. So when we come to the bottom of that middle column, resilience, self-confidence and well-being, we frequently hear about the way outdoor learning uh, enables kids to benefit from these things. But uh, the research I've been involved in has sort of built on that through that left hand column going up the way. Um, there's a lot of interest now in not that um, young people benefit, but why is it they benefit? What is the process that they go through in order to benefit? Um, and it seems what is emerging is that it seems the the more uh, what we call effective learning aspects around resilience, self-confidence, well-being, things like that, uh, self-perception. Um, it's important to develop those early on so that uh, they impact on the pupils' improvement engaging with learning. And that in turn impacts on the way in which they acquire knowledge, skills and understanding either during the residential or back in school afterwards. And obviously, we hope that that will impact on achievement and, and attainment. Um, at the same time, so that's looking at it from the pupils' uh, point of view. Um, at the same time, some things emerge from this project about uh, how schools might um, adjust to the outdoor learning opportunities. And one is around new pedagogic skills that teachers learn in connection with outdoor learning. And the other is about the cohesion of the classes back in school. 
Uh, next slide, Mari. So that's one thing I want to talk about. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is the way this, uh, the follow-up research has been phrased and framed. It's used something called a theory of change. Again, I suspect a lot of you know about this sort of approach to research. Um, and uh, all this slide is, is a, is a general, what does the theory of change look like type of slide. It's not specific to outdoor learning. But in that first box where it says context, we are obviously talking about in education. And the current state of the problem is how does outdoor learning impact on uh, beneficially on young people and in fact on the schools and the teachers and parents and so on. Desired long term income might uh, change, sorry, might be um, attainment, uh, achievement and attainment. And then there's a sequence of change, which is what I was talking about with the blue arrows on the previous slide. And finally, the uh, thing, chickens come home to roost here. Um, the assumptions are really around what resources you've got to do all of this. It's nice um, knowing that this sort of thing would work, but how, how do you go about doing it? So finally, Mari, I'd just like to go on to the theory of change and the implications for practice that came out of learning away um and we've touched on some of these uh the co-design side of the thing and this is something that might be preparatory to going away on the residential where the teacher and even the pupils might get involved with the provider designing what you want out of the residential um for the teacher this is essentially for teachers actually this slide putting the experience in social and academic context in the class beforehand perhaps um, and of course, I'm talking about residential uh, outdoor learning. This could be any resident, any educational intervention that I'm talking about here from that point of view. Um, make the most of the learning environment outdoors, primarily allow the kids to have fun. Um, from that, you build all those other things. Um, promote the improved relationships that occur, encourage the personal and social development, which underpins the progress overall. Um, and exploit that uh, to acquire new skills in um, understanding and uh, acquisition of knowledge. And afterwards, embed the experience in classroom work. Now, um, I, I, you know, a lot of this is pretty sensible, logical stuff, but the two things that really came out very strongly was how the outdoor learning experience um, is improved on the basis of co-design and learning a way um, was a co-design exercise uh, as much as anything and afterwards embedding the experience in the classroom. The outdoor learning intervention stand alone if you like just sitting there on its own um, might not you might not realize the impact from that um, unless you follow up in the in the classroom afterwards and by the way I would say one thing just going back to what Pete was saying there isn't a lot of money in this area of research but this particular project um, attracted two and a quarter million pounds from the Paul Hamlin Foundation to undertake this very large program of research. Um, many thanks everyone for listening. Uh, I guess I hand over to Neil now. Thanks Roger, thanks for that. Um, so I'll just cr crack on. Uh, following on from Roger, I'm going to be talking about residential experiences in um, the outdoors. So I work as a, a, a an instructor down here in South Ayrshire at the Dolphin House, um, and it's mostly residentials. Um, at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll uh, mention about what we've been doing with day visit groups as well, um, since we've not had residentials for over a year now. Um, the one piece of research that I did at the end of my part-time master's course and Murray House was um, ended up actually looking a bit at neuroscience and then trying to bridge that gap between the neuroscience and sort of education. And then I ended up, it was this question, you know, why uh, are residential outdoor learning experiences so memorable? They seem to be long lasting adulthood. I just um, remember these experiences. So, um, and it's part of the, the brain, the hippocampus the structure in the brain, hence the, the wee seahorse, which looks like your hippocampus. And I've got this memory 
jogger here. This is the newest bit of practical equipment we have, and I would recommend every local authority invest in this to get young people into like beach environments or the coastline or um, woodland environments. And it's actually called a hippo camp. So um, move on. Uh, thanks, Mary. So the wee bit of research that I did from a master's project took three years, actually, believe it or not. So it took a bit of time. So I'm a quite a slow learner. But what it did allow me to do was establish um, quite good data gathering and take my time. And I, I tried things, and then it failed, and then I tried other things. And I eventually came around to using um, uh, or looking at these psychological constructs of memory. So specifically episodic memories, um, which are related to place, uh, time, temporal, and emotions. So the I guess the outcome was these memories that young people would have and teachers in this social context, but driven by these emotional dimensions. So the emotional dimensions I was kind of looking at was positive and negative and very much uh, high arousal states that young people, as they, um, you know, imagine them, you've probably been uh, in a bus with kids coming to a residential, that euphoria, and then, uh, but also the homesickness, you know, which is a huge part, like the first night, and they suddenly go, oh no, I'm here myself, you know, and you get that homesickness sitting up with kids and then making sure they're okay. So that's what I was looking at. Um, and what was fascinating, I did data gathering, um, uh, focus groups interviews, and they went back seven years maximum, first year university students. And um, what I found, it came out hugely, was uh, social living. The bit, this wee, wee anecdotes and stories about friends, the, the, the teachers, the pupil teacher relationship, which comes out in Roger's stuff with the uh, uh, Learning Away projects. Um, the stories about the instructors, the, the just to be fun times being away, um, the disco and campfire, and then combined with that, the social context, the communal living, which I framed it like that. Um, I chose to code um, meal times as an activity and sleeping as an activity, just as valid as going in the caves or going up the hills, and and then um, it came out huge, hugely, as you might might expect or maybe wouldn't expect. So. The meal times, we've got a small centre, so we have one class at a time, so it's maybe different from a big residential centre where they have different, but every centre is different. Um, um, risk taking behaviour was an interesting one. Um, so, yeah, there's some quote, rich quotes from the study, so highlighting the pu pupil uh, teacher relationship and the eating aspect. So, um, neophobic behaviour of children, just that fear to try and new foods in a residential setting. It's when the stress hormones definitely are, if you could do a study, it's a very invasive study, but I like so hormones, stress hormones for young people. The dining hall is probably the biggest stressor. Like what foods are these young people going to have when they're away from home for four days and three nights? Anyway, it, it came out massively. And, we were, um, and then my key point is which Beth picked up on was negative. I was looking at negative as well. So they tend to not get focused on much, but some of the memories that young people come out with, um, they remembered their, their buddies falling out. Uh, they shared my dorm and then they had to get split up and they never made up. And then, so the negative experiences, I think, have that balancing effect. Um, okay, we'll move on. Thanks, Mary. So what I was looking at, this is a theoretical um, so sort of S curve. So the only measured aspect is the X uh, axis with the four days and three nights on the residential. And then, um, so I was looking at these high arousal states. And then um, the teachers did an emotional observation survey of the young people on the residential. And um, after doing the transcription and coding it all, um, you could see there was huge amounts of these high periods throughout the four days and three nights. Um, and low points as well. Um, so I chose to also analyze complex emotions, not the basic um, emotions of happiness and sadness. So the ones that came out quite a lot, social uh, observed fear, so the likes of um, the likes of uh, social fear uh, with their peers. Self-reflexive was more like the pride um, and that did come out a lot in the data. And one really interesting one, Schadenfreuden, where 
um, that also came out a lot in the data where the young uh, or deriving pleasure from the expense of others, so it's a more negative type ex um, emotional expression. Um, so you can see from some of these quotes. Um, counterfactual uh, it was also an interesting one. That was more like they remembered what they didn't do as much as what they did. Um, so the likes of, we were meant to go caving, but the tide was in, so they remember that. Um, and then if they remembered what they um, what they did that, and such in a positive affect, then that was that was good. Um, yeah, but it also helps you think about how you brief groups in the field um, in terms of briefing for disappointment. Really, if the if it's unsafe or um, and let's see what other ones I've got. Uh, epistemic, which is more like knowledge or interest. Um, we had a group of young people here today and they saw dolphins just offshore. And that that, that peak of like that spark might, um, if they go back to the school environment, back to the classroom, might just stimulate them to write a bit more. So the epistemic is purely researched, and uh, but it's got a lot of potential, the, the knowledge emotional bit for like linking with back in the classroom and attainment, I guess. Um, okay, we'll, we'll crack on. Um, so some of the implications for practice, definitely sleeping on residential. So the emotional homeostasis or balance and effect of emotions um, uh, would be really, really important, I think. So that was one of the things that came out. So the sleeping is probably one of the most important activities to do on, on a residential. And then consolidation of memory traces um, happens when you're sleeping after all these new experiences. Um, so that leads to novelty. So what I chose, novel familiar, which may be in a eating environment, but then the, so they'll be familiar with that, but novelty maybe with our teacher, with our instructors, with the class uh, is, is, is a novelty. And then novel unfamiliar might be like going caving and no frame of reference, no experience, they just don't know what to expect. So we try and have those near the end of the, residential experience. So how you program your your residential can be very, very important, how, the, how you challenge these young people in the field. Um, the role of free time, a lot of the memories were when there wasn't any adults, um, you know, and it was high, like the risk-taking behavior, hiding in the sweets and climbing out of windows or playing chappy, all those things. So the role of free time, very, very important. Um, let's see, psychological and emotional. Yeah, I've kind of mentioned bits and pieces. Emotional containment zones mentioned in psychological risk uh, literature, um, and definitely I saw evidence of sort of strain out with that in containment zone. But um, the key bit is trying to get back into it. So the recovery, I, I, I think anyway, is that recovery. So you've got emotional robustness. Um, so mental first aid. Um, so we'll keep going, we'll keep going. Um, the last slide I just wanted to mention was what we've been kind of up to as residentials haven't been operating. So this type of outdoor learning experience um, with a local school is uh, taking them on wee mini expeditions to so the language we use and using place-based learning. So we um, uh, took this wee bunch of egg, uh, this group, and uh, this lad Campbell, it was quite a character, but he'd been to Dolphin House before, so he knew us, so he had these um, so it wasn't like a one-off. This school could come in the primary four, primary five, and one in primary six even. So we knew Campbell. So we took them. It was the right distance for a, a day trip like this, and um, they get a lot of good learning from it. But they have the social context of like meal time um, at lunchtime, but not being away from home. So that's the sort of thing that's been sort of lacking, I guess. But hopefully the residentials will start back as, as soon as possible. Okay, I'll hand over because I'll probably talk too long. But um, so I'll pass over to Dave. Hello. So I hope you can hear and see me. Um, my name is David McKillop, and I'll just give a brief introduction because I come to outdoor education from um, a range uh, of different. Um, Backgrounds. So I used to work at, at centres much like Neil, and sometimes I wish I still do. Um, that's actually me in the green helmet there, taking some kids up a, a gorge um, to engage in outdoor activity, but also to learn about uh, environments. Uh, and one of the reasons that I wish I still did it is because I now am a primary school teacher. Um, I had my class today, I'll have them again tomorrow. 
And after this call, I'm, I'm on to write reports. So well done to all you teachers who are still here at 20 past five. Um, but uh, last year, um, or, or two years ago rather, um, I came to outdoor education research because I wanted to know more um, about something I felt I should know about. So we'll go to the next slide, Mary, and I'll take you through my research. So one of the questions I wanted to answer is, how is formalised outdoor education included in the Scottish curriculum? Because like I said, I felt that I should know, having a background in uh, outdoor activity and then being a qualified teacher. And I set about trying to comprehensively answer that. And just to summarise very briefly, I found that it is in the Scottish curriculum, you'll be pleased to hear, um, and it's in, in, in many different ways. Curriculum for Excellence um, had a world leading notion of, of teaching through capacities as well as outcomes and the interdisciplinary approaches um, that, we can be, that we can use as teachers in Curriculum for Excellence are fabulous um, in outdoor learning. And that led to research papers like Taking Excellence Outdoors, uh, Simon Beams, another Edinburgh University or former Edinburgh University uh, Outdoor Education Department member, um, identified the strength and relationship between um, curriculum for excellence and outdoor methods. And just a year later, that led to policy like curriculum for excellence through outdoor learning, which is a 28 page document where you can find practical advice and guidance for taking your classroom, uh, uh, taking your class outdoors. And even more recently, Beth has spoken about learning for sustainability uh, as we think about um, our um, place in the world as we think about how we're using resources and think about how we are being sustainable in our planet which really involves taking learners outside to enjoy their planet um, just a few other things uh, in Hegios 4 if you're wanting to improve your school there's lots uh, about outdoor learning uh, i'm sure inspectors want to see this um, it's not something that you're going to get caught doing uh, the gtcs new standards in 2021 have a refreshed focus on sustainable and outdoor methods and um, SQA qualifications. I can go on for forever, but this is something that is in the curriculum. Uh, next slide, Mary. And, and one of the most pivotal things that I want to share and um, that I found in my research um, is, is a mandate for, for outdoor education. And this statement in the document I mentioned, Curriculum for Excellence Through Outdoor Learning says, the journey through education for any child in Scotland must include a series of planned quality outdoor learning experiences. I like to go through that phrase and pick out different words and think about how that changes what I'm planning for my learners. Um, so journey, something about journey, going from A to B through education for any child in Scotland must it's a must, it is, it is part of um, our learning, it's part of our curriculum, it's something you should be doing. Include a series. How often is our uh, outdoor planning a series of linked lessons, just like the rest of, of, of learning, uh, of plans and quality? Uh, it's not something that, oh, it's sunny outside, let's, let's just pop out for, for 20 minutes this afternoon. It should be planned in quality, outdoor learning experiences. So it's something that's experiential. I'd love to go on about that for, for ages, but uh, I can't with the time. But um, Nichols concentric circle model, that's Robbie Nichol that, that Pete mentioned, the first PhD student, uh, legitimised the school grounds, the local area and day trips as much as the residential experience. Now, the residential experience is fabulous and um, it's something that I'm very passionate about, but it's maybe confined to a few little um, experiences in our education uh, or in a child's education. And we could be using the school grounds, the local area and day trips. Uh, I'll go to the next slide, Mary. So then I set about answering um, the question in my research, to what extent is this kind of learning happening in the primary school? Um, and I reflected on my own personal experience and I looked at literature, but I also conducted a survey. And these were the findings of the survey that I conducted. Um, I'll let you just read over it so you don't have to listen to my voice. But what it's showing is a majority of teachers didn't have any input in outdoor education in their initial teacher education, whether that was an undergraduate or a postgraduate. This isn't something that all teachers are encountering. Since graduating, many haven't attended professional development and 
a majority of teacher would, teachers would like for their training. We we'll skip on, Mary. So we have this strange um, dynamic that most teachers haven't been formally trained. And that was my research found that, but also um, to, to, to look at some other uh, findings from literature um, from Gray and Kaluchi Gray research concludes that most teachers in Scotland will have had limited or no experience of outdoor learning pedagogy. And um, from uh, Greg Mannion that, that Pete mentioned and colleagues, Scotland maybe cannot claim to be providing a comprehensive, balanced or inclusive educational experience outdoors. Yet, what the curriculum is saying is the journey through education for any child in Scotland must include a series of quality planned learning. Um, I put this little image in, nothing is written in stone. Um, I used that um, a couple of weeks ago when teaching my class um, in literacy about oxymorons. Um, and I maybe think that I could have used this to say, we should be taking learners outdoors, but teachers maybe don't have the best training in that. So next slide. In my research, I set about asking, what can I do to make that better? Instead of writing a dissertation for my master's course, I wrote an applied project. It is 60 credits at master's level, the same as a dissertation, but it opens with a theoretical and philosophical justification of 6,000 words, so half of um, a dissertation, um, before going to a resource. And the 6,000 words is just like a dissertation. I had to select a, a, a research methodology. I saw a question had come on about that, so I used action research, which I compared to practitioner inquiry that I'm sure many of us will have encountered in our probation year. I had to give a context for outdoor education in Scotland from history and policy. And then I had to identify that there was a need for further resource through my personal observation, through the experience of the survey that I just um, shared, and in supporting literature. I designed the resource and I concluded with the intended impact, which I separated into pupils, teachers, and environment, because I truly believe that um, if we are doing outdoor learning, there is an impact for teachers, for pupils, and for the environments where we live. Next slide and final slide, Mary. And this is what the resource ended up looking like. It ended up being a training for teachers that is theory and practice to try and identify um, and counteract the shortfall that teachers maybe aren't encountering um, training in their initial teacher education. It does provide some resource, um, but it encourages the, the participant to develop through engagement. You don't like to use cliches, but um, it's give someone a fish and they will eat for a day and give a fishing rod and they eat for the rest of their life. We're wanting to train teachers to plan their own quality learning outdoors. And I designed it specifically not to be death by PowerPoint. Uh, I hope to be able to deliver it in person. So it prioritizes experience, promotes questioning, and encourages collaboration and it is both inside and outside. I'll let you read sort of the chapters of the training and I hope you might see how that would address shortfall. And it is a resource that um, was developed in my practice as a teacher and I hope to implement now and um, seeking opportunities to implement it in North Lanarkshire um, and, and maybe further afield. That's just my research, my findings. Um, but my question to you is, what could you do? What have you noticed? What, where are you coming from uh, in your um, experience of the outdoors or as a teacher? Uh, what can you identify and what can you do to change it through outdoor learning research? We saw from Beth and Pete that this is um, a growing body of literature, a, a growing um, consensus that outdoor learning approaches are great for our pupils. Um, so what can you do to change it? seems a, a good place to end. So I'll pass back to, uh, to Mary or Mark. Thanks very much, David. That was excellent. Thank you all for everyone um, for a really, really fascinating and in-depth um, look at some of the research. I think Mary's just going to mention a couple of things about these slides. Thanks, Mark, and thanks so much to all of the, the presenters thus far. Um, we're just kind of aware that we wanted to to, sh to highlight to you some examples and research, particularly if you're working in the ELC sector, um, and these could be uh, useful places for you to, to explore, to, to think further, and we're happy to, to provide some of the links to that um, so that you can pick that up beyond uh, this evening. 
Um, Pete and others have mentioned that there is a really helpful for free publication available um, and it's called Learning Outside the Classroom, Theory and Guidelines for Practice. So if you have um, access to the GTCS website, we will be able to, to log in and, and to share that with you. And if you don't have access to that, we'll be able to um, connect you with that resource uh, free of charge. And it's not, uh, it's not like that Pete doesn't get uh, some monetary value for that. It's, it's absolutely free uh, to, to all in, in Scotland. And we have mentioned that uh, colleagues from other universities weren't able to, to join us this evening. And should you wish to, to connect with some of the, the place-based work, um, there's a really helpful uh, webinar and a re-extract of, of Greg Mannion speaking round about that, um, should you wish to do that. And indeed, a colleague, Sue Waite, in Plymouth University as well. So these slides and, and links will be available to you. Just before we kind of finish and, and wrap up and move on to some of the questions um, that people have submitted in the kind of open discussion, uh, we wanted just to kind of highlight to you the Outdoor Learning Weeklet. If you haven't seen it, it pinpoints lots of uh, useful resources. And I know there's been a few chat uh, comments in the chat round about the sort of um, Beyond Your Boundary and the Outdoor Learning Directory. So please feel free if you haven't already kind of had a look at, at these resources. Um, it's well worth a, a place to have a look at. And as we've said, Mark and I, is, this is a kind of one in a series of outdoor learning and professional learning sessions. So if you haven't had a chance to connect and you're looking for some professional learning at the end of a day or indeed over the summer um, and beyond, please feel free to connect um, with these sessions in your, in your own time. And please feel free to get in touch with us and to shape what we do moving beyond this evening. So we just wanted to kind of say thank you. A huge thank you from, from me and, and Mark and, and Ian on the call from Education Scotland to yourselves uh, for coming along and joining us this evening, for giving of your time to explore a little bit more about the wealth of, of research into outdoor learning, what it means, um, the benefits of it and how you can engage with that. Um, and a huge thank you to our um, re really um, experienced and well-learned uh, a, a researchers from, from Pete, from that overview, for Beth for that sort of really in-depth literature review, for Roger for his years of experience looking at outdoor learning, from Neil from his practice and his um, relation uh, studies about um, memories and the value of it residential and for David for bringing all of that together and thinking about what that means right now working in the classroom. So a huge thank you from me um, and Mark and Ian uh, to, to our presenters. I'm going to pause the recording now and we're going to move forward into some sort of discussion and question and answer space. So a huge thank you from me uh, to you for joining us this evening. Thanks very much, Mary. Um, also just to highlight, uh, I put in the chat earlier, we do, we